Ray. I don't know. I haven't gone there. Ray. Hi, John. Oh, wow. This is about two minutes behind. No, I've been behind it. So I need to find this thing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's because of FTC regulations. They can't say any of the restricted words. Now, the only thing I've noticed is that with the lights down here, I'm very dark on the video. So if I stand to the source lighting. Oh, yeah. That's I got that black band where the text is on this. You have a nice hat symbol right here for it. That's great. John Hack, maybe later. John Hack, gmail.com. You're good. You make a mistake with that. <laughs> so, welcome to the August 2014. You guys all watching the video in the back, too. Is that my voice that I hear? Sure, okay. of course. Okay, you can kill it. Oh, it's the acoustic John. So, <clears throat> the OLUG meeting for August 2014. As you can see, the room is a little different. Uh, we used to present over there, and now we present over here. Uh, some little bit of interesting trivia. Um, these door frames and windows are the original for this building from almost 100 years ago. Two of the doors are original with their original glass. This one is actually from the seventh floor, and that one's actually from the second floor. There is actually a room over here that um, you can't get to. It is completely sealed off till phase two. So this is phase one of the project. So this floor, this is the original floor from the room. When they stripped out the carpet, they had that black tar stuff and all sorts of glue. And they actually stripped it down and sanded it, and it became this floor. It's pretty interesting how that came about. Um, these tables can all be moved and rearranged into any way you want. Some of us know from moving this table, they're very heavy. Extremely heavy. So they should be pretty stable for holding a laptop. That's for sure. Um, for those of you who've never been here before, I am John Larson. I am the systems engineer with AIM here in this building. Hi, John. Hi, Hi John. This is our space here. This is now called the Combine Room, or the Combine. It's no longer the AIM training lab, so long live the AIM training lab and all the pieces of that. So we have all this interesting art, as well as many other things here in the So, um, unfortunately, does this having a noise? Is that too much noise? Is that all right? Because I can I can switch it off if we need to, because it is pretty loud. I don't think I'm close. Okay. So yeah, all the original ceilings. Obviously, the heating and cooling ducts were added later from the original building design. But um, the building is heated and cooled with water, chilled water and steam. Chilled water in the summer, steam in the winter. Spring and fall, the bump. And it kind of maybe runs for a day, for an hour, and then you turn it off because the temperature fluctuates so much. It has been a couple months since we had a meeting, uh, partly because this room was being renovated. Um, the first event in this room was the AIM board meeting, so it was being done for that hard date in the middle of July. So there hasn't been very many things happening in this room. Unfortunately, you may have noticed on the floor many of the uh, pads have come off. So, that they were twister dots. Yeah, make your own form of twister. So, left hand, white dot. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
see what other announcements are there. What, 3.16 kernel came out? So that's mm -hmm. out. Um, no surprise, Fedora has been delayed by three weeks, which means it might be next year. It's supposed to be Christmas time and Thanksgiving time. So will we see a whole year without a Fedora release? Maybe. Yes. Refactoring a lot of stuff. CentOS 7 came out. So for those of us running 6, the Evil Empire also released the workhorse 7. Yeah, I wonder how they got that. <laughs> and I noticed that there was actually an upgrade path from CentOS 6 to 7. Actually, I, 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 I haven't tried it yet either. I'm not brave enough yet. Um, I would probably try it on my powerful at home, but for right now, the Netflix needs to stay on. So, um, moving Cox was pretty interesting when we moved from our house to our apartment. We're, we're building a house, so we sold our house. Um, I put the cable modem in, put the firewall in. Worked great as soon as I powered it I'm like, oh, that's great. All that preliminary work with talking to the phone worked out well. Six hours later, it died in the middle of the video. Yep, I was watching. Because it was not activated. Now, I was doing all sorts of other troubleshooting to try to figure this out, because I don't use Cox DNS. So you don't know that it's asking for an activation. All you get is nothing. No pings. You can ping up to theirs, but then it ends. So luckily, a Cox tech actually answered the phone at 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Oh, well, we just need to activate you. Because I tried to use their web activator and it said, you got a call. Which kind of defeats the purpose of having a web activator. <laughs> yeah. So I just left the DNS over, bring it back, and I'm back with open DNS. Tonight, I'm going to talk about photography workflow. Now, this is my workflow that I use, it's not necessarily what you would probably use. You'd probably modify a little bit. Um, I'm going to try to talk about the steps and show some demos. Now, of course, that means there might be a demo to help you those. But we'll find out. Um, cool. We're running a live fi right? Problem? Well, when we were having problems earlier. Oh, OK. I'm a fixer. I have a goal in mind. I know. How do I get it? Mr. Redendis. I'm going to move this here. Okay. How many people have a camera? That's not your phone. Hey, all right. Whatever. What is photography? It is the art, science, and practice of creating. Durable images are recording light or other electromagnetic radiation. What this is electromagnetic radiation. Radio waves. What's that? Radio waves. Possibly. Either chemically by means of a light sensitive material, such as a photographic film, or electronically by the means of an image sensor. Yes, I got that from Wikipedia. You like how my, I'm, I'm using black and white on my slide? Digital photography uses the sensor to acquire images and store them on a digital medium. Did you know that the first digital camera was a Kodak in 1991 and it has 1.3 megapixels? It was actually a back to a Nikon F3. So, your front facing camera on most phones is 1.3 megapixels. That's probably why. It goes all the way back. Glad to be Glad to be So, there's a few terms I want to tell you about. Single lens reflex, SLR, DSLR is the digital version. An ILC or MILC, which is a mirrorless interchangeable lens camera. And, of course, point and shoot. Most people have what? Point and shoot. Point and shoot. Yeah. Some of them have a variable lens, so you can zoom. 
and welcome to Dunham. Obviously, these guys have the added expense of buying legs and that you attached to the body. Right? What's the difference between an SLR and a mirrorless camera? Mark. As you engage the shutter, the mirror flips up, records the image, and flips down. And that's the SLR. Yes. That's the reflex. Mirrorless cameras do not have a mirror or a prism. That's that little bump on the front of the camera. So when you're looking through the eyepiece on an SLR, you're actually seeing through a prism, which the mirror is reflecting the light up. And when the picture happens, it pulls the mirror out of the way and exposes the film or the sensor. It's a lot of work to get those very fast cameras to move that mirror out of the way when you're doing many, 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 many frames a second. That's why I like the Canon uh, 1D Mark IV and the, what's it, the T800S, I think it's the Nikon. Yeah. Those things are very expensive. And they're like huge tanks. And they're mostly used by professionals who do sports, photography, things like that. There are a few applications that I do use. I've been using G Hub for an extremely long time. I know that there's been other programs like F Spot, Shotwell, DG Cam, I think is the other one. But I just sort of stuck with that. It hasn't really advanced much, but it works for me. It does everything I want it to do. The only time I ever had an issue was when they changed something internally and it changed my file names on me when I was importing. So it took a bit to remember where that stuff was. How many of you are familiar with Lightroom? Okay. That's essentially what Dark Table is. It's for working with raw files. And we all know the GIMP and Image Magic. Both are used extensively for image manipulation. So, G Phone is my main photo management. It's essentially like iPhone, iPhoto, and Picasa, which iPhoto is going away, isn't it, Craig? What? iPhoto is going away. Not. No, Aperture is going away. away, and they, they're merging it in with the same thing. Okay. Well, it's an upgrade on iPhone. Oh, okay. So, of course, you can do all the minimal things negative, flip, crop. Everyone's favorite red eye removal. And color adjustment. That's essentially you're just working with JPEGs with this for the most part. So, <coughs> what pictures? Boy, I wonder what pictures I have on my computer. I did not vet this, so. It'll be just as much a surprise to you as it will be to me. Hopefully not. Nothing, nothing bad. Nothing bad. Sure, there's nothing bad. I take offense at that. So yeah, I've got all sorts of photos, and I usually arrange them by year, right? Nothing in, well, maybe there is something in there. Let's hope it's okay. Chapter. I never really thought about this portion. It's probably not a good thing. So, so, texting. so I do have my camera with me. This is actually not an SLR. This is a mirrorless camera. I always open this up. There is no mirror in there. It is a straight sensor. How's it work? Can you look through the lens? It's, uh, it has a uh, little screen instead. Oh. So some, some mirrorless cameras you just use a live view. And other ones have electronic viewfinder. This is, so this one switches back and forth when I bring it up. When you're looking through it, do you know which through the lens is that? No, you're seeing what the sensor's doing. So you're not looking through the actual lens. 
you're seeing what the lens sees onto the sensor, right? So are you using yeah. the actual screen with the target? Yeah, so you're just, so that, that's just the sensor, right? Right. So if I go to this, see how it kind of shuts off? Because it has the sensor to detect it. My question when you're looking through it, where are you looking? I'm looking through an electronic viewfinder. Yeah, yeah, it's a little tiny. So you representation of what and and there are very some cameras have you know higher dot pitch in these screens. Others don't. Kind of depends. Um, there, I guess I didn't put rangefinder on that list, did I? No, like the light goes. The light is a rangefinder, but it's very similar to this because it's a mirrorless. Yeah. In fact, um, there are adapters for this camera to use light lenses. In that's fact, a, that's an Olympus, right? Right. So this is an Olympus. There are adapters for this camera to use pretty much any lens ever. My brother picked one of these up after I got mine, and he has a 60-year-old Russian lens on his. It's called an Indostar. And it produces some great imagery. A lot of people think, well, I can use software to do the pictures. I don't need to have the lens. But the lens can do things that the software, yeah, I mean, you want to see it live. There's the live, right? It's just a better artistic thing. Yes? So with the uh, mirrorless cameras, in the same price range? Is it they're, so they're usually cheaper, right? In the like, three to five, six uh, probably okay. So there are there are cameras like the Canon Rebel, right, and the T3500, T3500, stuff like that. Those are entry level SLRs. They're also known as prop sensor cameras. They're you know we have 35 millimeter frame. That's what everything's based on, right? Um, this is a micro four third sensor. So um, my lens covers like half of what a 35 millimeter frame would be. So if you get a 50 millimeter lens on a full frame camera, mine, it would double that. So it would be like 100 on mine, right? So for instance, this is a 14 millimeter lens, which equates to a 28 millimeter field. So this used to be my pride of joy. This was my 14 Panasonic. This was the fastest thing I owned until I got my 40 class. That's 1.8. That's not. So. This is a lifestyle. You get these for like five bucks on Amazon. They're pretty cheap. So obviously, you're taking pictures, right? And I took some earlier. <coughs> and this thing, well, for pricing wise, the camera body on this was $1,300. Like the 5D Mark III is like $3,200. Okay. So, comparative body, yeah, the body's going to be cheaper. But when you get into lens pricing, then it's a whole different ball. So, yes, this may have been a $400 lens, but the equivalent on one of the like Canon or a Nikon, it's going to be quite a bit more. When you get fast lens, fast glass for those cameras, you might be $800 to $1,200 for one of those. And when you get into big lenses, then it gets really pricey. I mean, the lenses cost more than the camera. Yeah, they cost more than an automobile. They cost more than an automobile. There is actually a really nice fisheye lens that was produced, I think, in the 80s. I think that goes for something like $25,000. It's like this big. And it comes down to that little part where it attaches the camera, but the whole front is just a big curved glass. Remember, people have to polish this thing down. So, take my card out. 
This one uses an SD card. Most cameras are switching to that these days. When I got this camera in January, I started to do all my raw photos. So you'll see two photos here. One says JPEG, one says ORF. A raw image is actual sensor data. There's no manipulation. So whereas this guy is 8.4 meg, this one's 14. Right? And this is a 16 megapixel camera. So it tends to generate a lot. Now I put the card in and it immediately brought this up to be the important. Um, you'll notice that my destination right here, I have it set up for year. And that's in the preferences. So it automatically puts the year in. I don't have to mess with that. But the event and the tags are the things I want to name. It. So let's just call it OLO presentation. It'll be 24. It's just, that's like Unix time. That's the farthest it goes back. And I can even tag this and say, oh, well, what was it? Well, we'll just say known. Maybe it was in four. In a holiday. So I can go ahead and just import right now. Now you notice down here there's a checkbox that says delete imported files from source. I'm not going to delete them right now. I'm just going to import them and let it go. But I have to select which ones I want. So let's say I choose the first three pictures. Let's say import. So this is not right. It, not at that point, yeah. You can't do it for the thumbnails, if I remember correctly. Yeah, maybe you need the thumbnail. Dark table will read it. So, okay, that's a picture I did earlier. Pretty neat license book. Um, if I want to see the actual resolution, here's the number one. So that's that's a pretty big image, right? It is so big it's still on my laptop. And you can do all these plug-in stuff. There's the adjust color, change the brightness, right? This is G-Thumb, yep. So if I were to move off this, oh look, I just crashed it. See? Demo photo. Now it did already import my photos. But there's the 2014 folder, and there's the OLED presentation. So it did do it. That's the Navy. So the 2005 just kind of like engineer. Yeah. There is a way to share this. Like, if you have a Flickr account or a Facebook account, it will actually upload those selected photos to those accounts. Or you, or you can actually make a web album, and it gives you some control, like where to put it, header, to footer, index page, what to put on there, top. So you can actually see the file name and that's. A few themes that you can use. So, meet round. And then it'll save it to a folder and upload it to one of these. Okay, so that's the one. If you want a geo tag or if you want a PBS tag on that camera, so I'll just select all the rest of them. If something you have to add to it, or you can tie it to the GPS to the phone, or. For me, it's the phone. This camera has Wi-Fi built in, mm -hmm. and I can apply the geotagging from my phone. I can actually take pictures with the phone using the camera. So like if you're doing uh, a group portrait, you can you can oh, essentially go you can go okay connect, you can go focus on that person, and then hit the shutter button. Yeah. 
So, um, so here's all the stuff that came in on this picture. Here's the dimensions, the date, uh, exit generation compares, camera model, version of the software on the camera, artist, ISO 200, desktop is 4.5, and I mean, there is so much stuff in these files. Say, autofocus was used. See if I can find. So that's all the metadata. That that's all the metadata that gets sent. The notice a lat log is probably empty, you know, because there's nothing there. It'll tell you if the flash fired or not. <laughs> Face to check was on or off. Just about everything you can think of is in this file. It's crazy <laughs> how much info is stored in this. And a lot of people. Before uploading photos online, there are programs that will strip all that out. Because you don't want necessarily geotagging information if you're taking pictures of your living room. Oh, look at that TV. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, one of the functions of the camera is you can do copyright. So it actually sticks my name in the exit data. I just did this today, so this is going forward. It'll have my name in, in all the pictures. So is the exit data not editable? It is editable. So it's a right row that you could write You could, yeah. So this one allows you to copy. There are specific programs for editing exit. Edit, make changes. There's the historogram for that photo, for the color. So if you take both of these Yes. I just started to do that when I got this camera. Um, in case I want to make some changes to something from that little dark, I can bring the colors up. So why do you just take it off? Because sometimes I pull them onto my phone and use them instead of them. So with that Wi-Fi function, I'm able to do it. That and my family really likes to have something so good. Pictures now, not pictures later. Yeah, exactly. So now I'm going to run this import again. It's amazing how many pictures I actually did take this afternoon. So we did the first three. Now let's just import the rest. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ola, Ola, presentation two. I'm going to say please. Please. And I'll make it my favorite. <laughs> my favorite. For science. And it was a part, right? Yes, it was. So with all these, it'll take a much longer time Import this. Now I actually have a USB 3 card now, card reader now, so that's a bit better when importing all these things. But uh, I did a wedding and my that vacation trip. It took an hour to bring all. This is a 32 gig card. I was using fours and eights, but I finally upgraded so I could do. A lot more photos. I did a wedding in uh, May. I wasn't the official photographer. The official photographer left two hours into the wedding. And so I took pictures of everybody who was dancing with the bride and groom. Got home, found out I had 900 photos. I was like, holy moly. I just don't want to be those people who say, hey, you want to come to a party? Hey, bring your camera. Uh, I'll do it when I want. Yes. There's a theory that a lot of professional photographers use 
medium sized cards that always interchange so yeah. they have three or four so they always so well not only three or four cards, they use three or four camera bodies. Because they'll leave one lens on one body and one lens on another body. So they don't have to sit there and switch it. They'll just grab a different body. So it's not gonna give up which one you're ranking from the Right. So your camera's Wi Fi will it put it automatically, I mean if you want to set a lap if you were serious about a particular shoot. Could you set your laptop someplace and have an automatic sync to the laptop? I would probably buy the iFi Pro to do that. Because it would just automatically up there. Are those good? Yeah, I've had them for five or six years. Okay. The iFi Pro X2. The, the Pro versions allow you to pair with a computer and upload your record. There are other versions, so that's what we can't. They're non Pro versions, upload to their site, and then we're out here. What does this cost? Like 50, 200 bucks. I bought my 860. For the 8 that I bought, it came out, the 8X2, it was like $8,500. Now it is a lot cheaper. Um, actually, I actually have a 2 gig. The first one I bought in 2008. And that doesn't have as many features. Um, we do actually have location and hotspot and stuff in these i5 cards. So I just got an email the other day that said, Hey, your hotspot subscription is expiring. So there's like a database of a whole bunch of sites that you can subscribe to for the card. So like I walked into Starbucks when I was in LA last year and the card was turned up and I just had to sit down. One thing is it uses the battery. So it's easier to plug into a laptop and use the battery out of that to the uploads. But yeah, I find cards are pretty good. <coughs> I, I would recommend them. Now, they aren't compatible with every camera, but they are compatible with most. Well, they have their own in SD. Their own in SD, correct. You can't really put them in an adapter for a compact flash. Um, and some of the new cameras, there's power management. They talk to the card with the power management. So that they can turn off the card for what it knows that it's done other things like that. Is it, is it pretty, I mean, how fast it's slow, or is it? It's as fast as your network connection. I mean, you'll feel it, you'll actually feel that, that side of the camera a little warm. Because uh, not only is the battery running, the car will warm up too. So, I, I have not used my iPad card in maybe six days. So, I'll take that with my brain salt and everything I've ever seen. But if, you, if you've got a mom who takes pictures with kids or a grandmother and they never plug their camera in to download the photos, it is the best thing in the world. I bought one for my mom. She just has to remember to turn her computer on and turn her camera on. Because she, she doesn't know where the cord is. And that's the first thing that goes missing is the cord to download the photos. With an iPad card, you turn it on. Take care. So what else did I take pictures of today? Well, there's my Cray 1000 board in my office. Great. The wonderful uh, emergency stop button. And there's Tom. Lots and lots. What an ugly bastard. Now, one thing that I've noticed is this is a quick succession of photos. There are. Many, many photos. Let me switch to this again. It gets better. It was about, <laughs> in three seconds on this camera, I took 22 photos of It's pretty fast. It's like 9 frames a second. So for Auto Awesome, it's great. It produces some of the best Auto Awesome that you've ever seen. Yes, there's a lot of Okay, here we go. 
This was an auto awesome with the high speed turned on. Let's see how our internet works today. It's loading every single frame. What's the auto awesome? Google, if it sees a number of frames that are very similar, it animates. Yeah, if you upload it in your Google Plus account. And for the most part, like my cell phone automatically uploads every photo I take so that I don't I lose the phone, I still have the photos. But yeah, you'd think that was video, but that is just that's just the frames replaying over and over again. So having that high speed, I mean there's a low speed too, you don't have those that high speed. For the most part, and you can see several of these animated photos right now. If you, for Google, if you, if you have a resize turned on, it limits it to 24 gigs. It's unlimited. If you turn on the full size version, it's limited to how much storage you have. And that's already a lot of folks. 62 files. So, dark table, back to this, is specifically designed to work with raw files. You can make a lot of changes to it, and it's pretty much more flexible than JPEG. Because JPEG is compressed, right? These aren't compressed. So you can you can write out new versions of it and you can change the amount of loss that you want on it. Mm -hmm. Does it do that and start to edit You can go and undo things, yeah. Well, it's like in Lightroom or Aperture, uh, you have the the wrong file, then you have the new touch. So you Add filters on top of that. that oh, so you get the output of the final or changes the color it's value the or whatever. And that's what you can see, and that's what you have to mm -hmm. But you can always go back to raw file and bring up the other Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how it works. I have not used it. I'm just starting out that portion of it. But there's always somebody who asks the question is there light here? There isn't, but there's this. Um, my brother used this in him to color correct the photo of my parents from the wedding that had completely faded over time. But when we took it out of the frame, everything around the outside was the right color. So he had to adjust the inside to match the outside color. Yeah, that'd be hard. So I mean that's pretty good for raw file. It's not as bright up there because of the projector. But now we'll get read all the different, you know, be, between Canon and Nikon, the raw's a little, you know, they're, they're all different. You're right. And, and and one thing you always see is you'll see Adobe has released a new version of Camera Raw 1.3, and it has all these new cameras. And I don't know how much the raw format has changed between cameras. It's more of a, we'll read the profile of this camera sensor to know how to do certain things. I think that's how it works. This guy has a lot, excuse me, a lot of videos on how to do this. <coughs> Uh, they're on YouTube. They really do a lot more than what I can say about it. I was using all the same information.
but this is the next thing I want to work on is the and changing the reason why I actually have taking those photos. That's on the prison. That's 300, that's essentially a 600 millimeter photo. How many people have used the GIMP? Okay, so I'm not going to talk about it much since most people know about it. It's like Photoshop, it has layering. You can do a lot more stuff than she comes in terms of editing, removing things, and trimming things out. Magic Lasso is a wonderful thing for trimming out people. Um, I'm working on a, a flyer for our family reunion. And I was asked to take a photo of my grandmother for the flyer. It has my aunt in the photo. They don't want anything else but my grandmother. So editing that photo down takes time. So I used the GIMP to produce that. Just everyone used GIMP in its native mode when it opens up, where you have all these little boxes everywhere. Is there any other way to use it? Well, there's this called single window mode now, where everything is inside the same box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because by default, normally, it's like this, where everything is totally separate. That's true. If you want to put that. So, <laughs> I'm so happy when they introduced that mode. Of course, now I just posed up my look. <laughs> That's okay. What did they get to see the mode? Probably about two, three years ago. There's a, there's a picture from some schoolwork. Maybe I just want. This I don't think I'll ever hear about the next one. I only want this part of my image for school, and I'll save that out and put it in my report. One to one. So what about Tyler's in? The only thing that I was really annoyed at with the newer versions of him was it wants to save everything next to yeah. Even though I open the JPEG, I have to say overwrite or save as an export. If I say save, it's XDF. I'm sure there's probably a way to change that. Does it need just format? It's GIMP's format, you know. It's like PSD. Well, can you just get rid of the that dot extension and put uh, <laughs> Well, select files by type. See, that's all you got. Oh, got it. See, well, I haven't used it in a while. So, so if I was going to say export as, then yes, your choices become much more robust. Once you export, why did they change that? Like I said, there's probably going to change it back. Probably it needs to fix it. Preferences. Let's look. We have time. Interface. No, take too much time. All right. I am not a big image magic person. I prefer to use the GUI tools for camera stuff. But if you're converting on a server, it's awesome to change stuff all that. But you can add watermarks with image magic. There's all these image magic uh, recipes and how to do things right away. It's a pretty neat resource. But um, the whole watermark thing. I might talk about that in a second.
So essentially, these are your steps. You're going to import, categorize, sort, process, backup, publish, and print. So if you're going to take pictures, you probably want to do some form of that. You already saw me import and categorize, right? That was all part of the first portion. Using G-thumb, it detected it off the mount. I have normally delete on import. So I'm going to bring everything in. I chose my categories and my folder names are based on the text. So it might be A slash infotech slash day one. And it'll make that whole directory true for me. Now, does GPhone do any bad reading of files? I believe there is a rename. So, like, yeah. There is, a, there is a tool that I don't have in this presentation that I found. It is just made for downloading photos from your camera. It has up teen options. I think it's just called Photo Download. But it'll change file names. It'll do all this stuff on the import. So, like, if you stick a card in, it'll just go. Just go. I mean, G thumb is asking you questions. This thing will just do it. And assume you're going to work on them after the fact. So, like, if you've got a stack of 20 cards, yeah, you're probably going to want to use that program. Just keep sticking them in until the next one's done. So, if you're processing, you may have to remove red eye. I haven't seen red eye for quite a while. I think it's just because my camera is better than what I used to have. Um, the previous camera I had to this was an EPL2. It was still an Olympus. So all the lenses work the same. I just changed the camera body. And you can get those pen cameras pretty cheap. I saw one on Newegg for like $229. That contains this lens and the camera. Right. Most of the time, I am doing resizes because these things are pretty huge when I get them in. Um, I don't really have to crop or do any color adjustments unless it's pretty dark. But this thing works pretty good in low light. Oh, the other thing about this too, um, there's a five access image stabilization built in. So the sensor will try to hold your place if you're doing this. So as soon as you have to press to focus, you can actually hear the thing moving. It's like shh. So you can actually do one or two stops down the normal to get pictures in the front. Please, cut back up your photos. My brother had his uh, G4 PowerBook, and he had about 400 photos from a trip. PowerBook died. No backup. Photos were gone. Not a good thing. To be fair, that G4 PowerBook was in at least once a year to get repairs. Not from him, the logic board would go out. He had three different keyboards on the thing. It was just a lot of repairs. Yeah. And there were pictures that he took at Disney at one in the morning after it rained. Oh, and it was really neat. All the reflection of those lights. Because you only have these things called extra magic hours. So it like you're there at the resort, and they say extra magic hours tonight. Everybody else who's not in the resort leaves. You stay. So you get a, you can be there until like 2 in the morning. And they still have rides and stuff going. And there's no lines. So what, what I do, um, and I, I really need to get one of my computers back up at home. Now. As soon as I import, I've got an rsync script that will sync my photos. 
that I run that. And I will usually plug in my external drive and sync to that too. So now I've got two copies. And I used to have a third, in the, and this is like three copies in the house. That's not the greatest. You really want to have a backup online. So by posting the photos in my Google Plus account, they may not be full size, but at least they're back there. My current photo directory, I think, is 120 gigs, which probably is a lot on, on my phone. And I know it's going to hide. And now that I'm doing raw, it's actually growing faster. So that's going to have to change. I actually have like 200 gig of my Google account that I need to uh, use so I'm not doing it. But some nice options. Um, Synology makes some great two hard drive NASAs that are really nice. I'll talk about that in a second too. Um, I need to get one of those. And I want my brother to get one. Why? Free NAS is cheaper. Free NAS is cheaper than Free NAS is cheaper and you're using ZFS. Okay, so will it automatically let me do click, click, and sync with another one across yes. the country? Yeah, it will. Yeah, well, I mean, Synology is kind of nice because it's got a slick GUI. I mean, it's got yeah. a lot of work in Sorry. Go ahead. Well, oh, if anybody does have a Synology mask, please update. Yeah. There is a vulnerability right now that will. It's like Crypto Locker, Synology NAS. Oh. Cool. Yeah. It's like SIM locker or something like that. So it'll lock all your files. But at least have some amount of mass storage that has two drives to do backups. Um, I use my Mythbox to do my main backups for my music, photos, and documents. That machine has not been up now for almost four weeks because I've moved. That's the next thing to put back together so I can continue my backups. Now, I also have an external backup on my desktop, and that runs every week. And then it has versioning using uh, duplicity. So, please, if you've been to my backup presentation, please back that. Publish and print. Tom knows I post a lot of photos to do Google Plus. I don't really do much Twitter. Um, some people, I know Adam had a gallery site. He still runs that. Or you have your own specific photo site. Maybe it's like 500 Fix or Flickr or something. Like that. I've heard good things about SmugMug, but I've never really looked Yeah, I have too. Um, Flickr now allows you to have a terabyte. And you're not paying for it. You just get a terabyte when you sign up. I had a Flickr account. I didn't have anything uploaded. But then they kind of said, well, you have to have a Yahoo account. I lost the access. So okay. a good online backup, by the way, blaze back. Blaze back. So I need to put a crash plan. You heard about that one? Yeah. Okay. Blaze back works with Linux. Yeah. yeah. I have used Shutterfly to print photos. They come out very nice. Um, there is also Snapfish and some other ones. And I mentioned something about watermarking earlier. That's a big debate amongst people. Um, watermark directly and come wrong. On the bottom? No, I mean like. Or the ones that go through the middle? The ones that are just big, blah, in the middle. Well, there's some that are half toned in the middle, which I agree detract from the photo. But those are usually on sites that are selling photos. If you're the artist, you may have your name down at the corner. Some people do that. Some people just use the exit information. Like all that stuff can be changed. Why don't I watermark the front of the Yeah, I have a logo in the middle of the photo. That's, so that's a different use case. If you're trying to let people see your photos, putting a giant watermark in the middle, eh. But if you like to put your site name, like your website, that's to me, that's legit. No. I just haven't done it. It's more of a, 
don't have the time to learn to do this. That's my biggest thing. I mean, I know Danny Chu, every photo he uploads has his watermark. It's great. Even the picture I printed out with me and him has a watermark. So now I know the difference between my photo of him and, him and his photo of him. Different angle. But I haven't done it. You know? It's just for family and friends. I'm not in it to make money. I'm not a professional photographer. I'm far from it. You know, my brother has 25 years ahead of me on photo. He's going to So that's pretty much it for the presentation. Question. What was the desktop? Gita. Uh data. Is that the same as Duplicity? It uses Duplicity in the back. The only, the only bad thing about Deja Du is there's only one backup. Um, Duplicati also uses Duplicity. You can do multiple backups with that one. Um, for my case, I just use Deja Du. Like the laptop, it keeps trying to back up once a week. When I plug it in the network at home, it'll back up whatever changed. Right. And, and you can choose Amazon S3, your Google Drive, all these things to back up your stuff. Duplicati will allow you. That's, I have a friend of mine who runs a business and his cash register I back up that way using Duplicati. So it iterates and does it every night, which is much better than what it used to be, which was nothing. It's hard to back up DOS these days. I think one of the things that a lot of people with photography now, you know, you know, all of our smartphones basically, you know, S3. How much time was that? It's pretty decent. Pretty decent. Yeah. Not for some kind of. Dropbox app on the smartphone. And so what happens is they just run photos in the lake or someplace, they automatically have to the Dropbox. So the way it went sort of like that, too. And then I downloaded the and you know, to see. You know, so it's a pretty simple process. I think that should be storage of some people who spend a lot of money on DSLRs. The quality you can get from our store in class just gives you so much better results. I, I forgot to talk about my phone. Um, I do have it set to automatically upload everything, but I do download out of the phone. Um, Gcom will actually recognize it because the folder name is DCIM on the phone. And that iPhones that really do this as well for one of those boxes. But it uses um, either the MTP or the PTP protocol for most phones. And it's the same process that we stuck all the photos in. Um, another way you can use this is a program on Android called AirDroid, which essentially is a browser-based access to your phone. So you, you start up the process on your phone, you put the IP in your browser, and you connect to it. And you could say select all photos, download, and get your big set back. You can also text. It'll text through your phone from your desktop. Works on Linux great. Because it's just a browser proxy. But I cleaned off a whole bunch of photos off of my phone before I went on a trip. It was probably three or four hundred on. It's quite surprising. But please back up the photos on your phone. Because since that's the number one thing that people use, 
that's the first day that gets lost. In photos of your kids or long relatives who have passed away, I was asked to do recovery for someone's stuff recently. And that's a whole different conversation. Mm -hmm. um, is that test disk is the name of the utility? Yes. The photo rec tools? Photo rec. Yeah. I've taken parts from cameras that have been used several times and still pulled photos off of them. Well, I formatted it to no, you didn't. It'll be erased from the file act file to that table. Didn't actually delete the photos. Yes. And 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 if you're going to take pictures of things you don't want other people to see, don't use a camera or a phone that automatically uploads. <laughs> <laughs> We need our vacation. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. maybe you yeah. should amend that to say use a film camera. <laughs> you can use a film camera. I, oh, I should have brought that with me. I actually did get a new camera this summer. Um, my cousin was getting married, and she wanted to make a nice little photo thing, and. and they got a, a blackboard, and they're going to write a message on the blackboard and have their photo taken. But they wanted to put them up right away. So I thought, well, one way to do it would be to use a photo printer, right? Well, that can get expensive. That's a lot of ink. If you're talking 50 photos, yeah. So, um, there's still technology available, such as the Fuji Neo Classic. This is a film camera, right? Guess what kind of film it uses? Oh, really? These are 50 exposures for 35 bucks. Remember Polaroid cameras? Yeah. Where they come out? That's what this is. Oh. Yes. Yeah. There was so you can't get Polaroid film stuff. Right? How much do you think that film costs? There's a free pack for 35 dollars. Free pack for 335. That's 300. It's 30 prints. It's 30 prints. It's 30 prints. Right? Now that's the original. If I go to the Impossible Project, which who now makes all the Polaroid film, that is 23 dollars and 49 cents for eight exposure. So if you have an old camera, you can still get the film. But my Instax was a much better buy. I bought 100 exposures for 75 bucks, And I used most of them. She had them instantly for her wedding. And they had them all up there, and it was great. Kids had no idea what they were seeing. You know, like six-year-old kids say, watch this. And they were just spelling. The watch, yeah. the photos developing in front of their eyes. I take a picture of the kid while they're doing that. Yeah. I, I did this to my nieces and nephews. I said, I guarantee you've never seen this one. And one of them said, I don't want my picture taken. And as soon as she saw it come out, boom, she was like, take a picture of me, take a picture of me, take a picture of me. And I said, here you go. Take it home. Tangible. You know, you gave <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to capture your soul with my Instax camera. So take pictures, enjoy taking pictures. Have fun with it. You know, the Back it up. One thing he was talking about is uh, visualizing all the movies. Oh, yeah. Oh, we can cover that. Well, um, I had it. I built a camera for one of the tools they have for the camera. Is that the negative one? But it does negatives, it does uh, slides, 
uh, with different grant holders of those performance. But the bottom line is that it, it takes a visual image of that image that's either negative or positive. And uh, so it's about five seconds it takes a shot to move on. So uh, you can do a lot for your craft. Now the image quality isn't very good. But if you're, what I did before, I did about 5,000 slides that I had to hang around. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to capture the catalog mm -hmm. so that I do what I can. So that I could, if I ever need to, go back to that image. That's popular. Yeah. yeah, but I can't bring all that to the aperture. And so then I can put in a face and I go, I do something. And then I can go back to that image and do something with it. And we we worked on scanning about three or four thousand of my grand And it was quite the variety. Um, so we did not use this. Okay. What did you do? Um I my cousin did it, I'm not exactly sure what he used. I own one of these, it's pretty cheap. It certainly wasn't two hundred and thirty dollars. I paid eighty eight dollars. So that I don't know why they're asking that price. But this is just a simple, this will do four by sixes, and there's an SD card in the back, and they'll do negatives. I've used, I've probably scanned upwards of five to six hundred photos, but with an older uh, Epson flatbed scanner, but it's of a version that I can put. Do you have the back lid for the yeah, and but I can put like four photographs, and it understands I want four files instead of one. Oh, that's file. nice. Right. There is now, a company. I mean, that's right now. pretty old. Right. Called Peggy Bay. And they do video, as I think as well as photo. Where you give you take the stack to them, and they'll give you like a disc. There, there's a place that I can sign up to scan, scan and of course they test you all the time with the deal of you can play the brass recorders part. But uh, bottom line is that you know if you watch the sales for like 20 cents, you can send an image off in groups of whatever and have it scan and digitize and actually go in and clean it up. Oh, you can nice. Yeah, so what they do is you set up another photograph or you can get slides or whatever. And you're Requirement is to take your equipment. So let's do a quick scan of them all. They'll throw them up on the website. And you, you go through and ones. you say, I want these 50. And then you get back to the ones. The problem is that I think they send them to you. So they're out of country, out of sight, out of line. Oh, yeah. Hope you don't lose them. I hope you don't lose them. Wow. Along those same lines, I've used Costco. I have a lot of old uh, VH, uh, VHS. VHF compact, VHSC compact oh, yeah. from when I was in Europe. And Costco, and they ran a coupon, and I got uh, like about 16 tapes digitized onto five DVDs. In the bottom, the cost of all that ended up being like. Thirty-two dollars, which I thought was dirt cheap, considering. I mean, I didn't. You know, you got to rig something up to play it to even get it in and convert analog to digital. Yeah, I was pretty pleased. I didn't know what kind of results I'd get, but I was very happy. Any more questions? Do you use any offline storage like Blu-ray or DVD? It got to be too much of a problem. I did it for like a couple of years, but yeah, it's fine. once I got more than four gig, I was just like, oh, well, this isn't really going to work out. Yeah, that's a lot of this. Yeah. My philosophy to external drives is every three years replace them. <laughs> They're bad or not. Three years. And I'm coming up on that right now. I need to replace some of them. Why the three nests are available so that it's sure, but I know 
The larger the disk, the more the failure that I'm worried about. Yeah, you got more and but I question if you buy a smaller capacity disk and you better run. In their life? Yeah. No. I mean they all well, you don't have the same space. Space. Yeah, a, even if it's smaller capacity, they're still gonna do that same reporting density you know, just to make it cheaper to produce. The only difference in smaller capacity is less flatter, less than And I partitioned it because I couldn't figure out how to use it that much in one space. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this big time between failure was like twenty thousand I never turn off my machine. I mean, you never turn off every year. Every time you do, I have to turn back on. Every time you do what? I have just failed. Oh man. Probably when the GFI is I know you don't want to hear that. No, I don't. What about the large uh, SSDs? You know, it's all the same. You know, they're still getting better and better. And I heard um, on a podcast the other day that some of them are getting down to 40 cents a gig. And then there's a newer controller out there, like the 3D flash memory. And they're doing like half a terabyte drives now. Yeah, two or three hundred bucks. How much? Yeah. But what type of SSD mm -hmm. chip is it? It's a trilo. Oh, you put your own slash lock. You can get right. Then somebody puts seven SSDs on it. You're right using it. And uh, what? That's a real SSD. Uh, several failed. The problem of doing some of those tests is that in normal drive use, you're either putting data on or deleting it, and then the trim takes care of what's been deleted and say, these sectors are available. If you're writing data so fast, it may not have a chance to get catch up, so it may fail premature. And I'm I just got an SSD. I'm going to put it in my desktop. I haven't done it yet. I haven't had time. I love it. We drive an SSD. Yeah, this is. Yeah, I went to do this. I went to do this. I went to do this. Now, this is an SSD. That's fine. So, it's just a matter of getting it done. I want to do it to my laptop before I wait for a new laptop. I mean, yeah, I said it. You can also get the combo drives, and those are kind of nice. They're not they're not full on SSD, but the, the, the whole reason they made those is so they didn't have to jack up the speed. Yeah, so you do that. That's why the customer did the flyer such as. I won't buy it. So maybe I'll make an animated gift of Tom. Oh, great. Thanks, <laughs> Tom. Sure. Yeah, great job. You're welcome. Where everybody picks up, but. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. We've got an announcement. Hold on. Okay. On. One of the other groups I belong to is the Omaha Maker Group. And the Omaha Maker Group will be putting on a mini Maker Fair Saturday, September 13th at the Omaha Children's Museum. So two things. First, it, it, it's not a kid's event. It's for grown-ups or kids of all ages. So we can't go. Yeah, you guys can't go. But they might let you. Second thing, uh, if you have things that you do that would fall into the realm of being a maker, which would be technology, any kind of inventing, any kind of tinkering, any kind of possibly, 
We're still looking for people to exhibit at the fair. So go to omahamakerfair.com and click on the link, I want to exhibit, There's a, or call for makers, and fill out the form, and we'll get you set up. Uh, the admission to this will be the price of admission to the Children's Museum and the Maker Fair will not be an extra charge based on that. So, yeah, it runs from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. with just one day. I can tell you right now we've probably got 30 exhibitors and hopefully more on the way. So, love to see you there. Thank you. So I'm going to end the broadcast. Bye.